And we are joined now by ABC News contributor and former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. After ending his own run for the White House in 2016, he became a backer of then-candidate Donald Trump and served as an informal advisor when Trump became president before breaking with him over Trump's false claims about the 2020 election and the January 6th attack. Chris Christie is out with a new book this week, Republican Rescue, Saving the Party from Truth Deniers, Conspiracy Theorists, and the Dangerous Policies of Joe Biden. Thank you so much for being here, Governor. Thank you, Lindsay. So we're going to get to the book in just a moment. Congratulations on it, Thank first you. of all. I'd like to start with news of the day sure. for a moment. Of course, uh, Steve Bannon turning himself in today on those criminal contempt charges. As a former federal prosecutor, how do you see this going for him and others like him, like Mark Meadows, who are refusing to comply with the Select Committee's investigation? Well, I think that, that Meadows and Bannon could be in two different situations. Yeah. Okay. You know, Bannon was not an employee of the federal government, not an employee of the White House. And so I think it's very tough for him to claim that he's covered by executive privilege when he's outside of that White House orbit. Mark Meadows, as the White House chief of staff, clearly was was an employee of the, of the White House and close to the president. Um, so we'll see how the courts deal with those, whether they deal with them the same or not, because the third factor is this. Donald Trump's no longer the president. So the ability to exert executive privilege is in the president's hands. And Joe Biden has said he won't exert executive privilege over this. So it's going to be a very interesting legal case. I think Bannon is in the worst position um, and, and Meadows slightly better. He's been a private citizen, of course, since at least 2017. And just to follow up on that, how likely do you think that the former president will be held accountable through the Select Committee's investigation? Unlikely, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, and it depends on what you mean by accountable. I mean, uh, they're going to raise, I would suspect, a lot of factual issues that uh, Donald Trump's going to ultimately have to answer uh, if he wants to remain in public life in any way. Um, but in terms of direct accountability legally, I still think it's unlikely that we wind up prosecuting former presidents. Um, it's just not in the American history, and I doubt it will happen. But, you know, you never know, given whatever the circumstances might turn out to be. But I think unlikely that will happen. All right, let's get to the book. You write, before Republicans can rescue America, we need to rescue ourselves. And you write in great detail about the conspiracy theories and lies surrounding the election in 2020. Have you seen any indication that Republicans feel that they want to be rescued, especially because very few in power at this particular point seem to be condemning Trump or his message? I do, and, and, and it's actually pretty timely. The Des Moines Register came out with a poll today where they asked Iowa Republicans, who, as you know, are some of the most conservative Republicans in America, um, where's your greater loyalty, to the Republican Party or to Donald Trump? 62% said the Republican Party. 26% said Donald Trump. So that's a big change, I'd say, Lindsay, from a year ago. And I think, you know, we're in an instant gratification society. Everyone wants change to happen like that. And it often doesn't. But we're, we're nearly a year since the last election nearly 10 months since Donald Trump's out of office. And I think you see the emotion starting to drain out of it a little bit and people starting to make an evaluation. So I think you have to tell people the truth. We have to be the party of truth. And if we're not the party of truth, then we're going to have a hard time getting power back and being able to lead the country in a different direction. You spent about the last third of the book really talking about how Republicans need to focus on the future, let go of the grievances of the past. Of course, today, uh, President Biden signed into law the bipartisan infrastructure bill. But many of the Republicans who were part of that, who backed it, are now being targeted for doing so. How is that how does that exemplify focusing on the future and the desires and needs of Americans? Well, the people who are targeting folks are not. And so this is a discussion and, a, and, and, and a, an argument that has to happen within the party. And the book is an attempt to start to, to create that argument and that conversation inside the party so it can be resolved. But remember this, too. The 19 members of the United States Senate from the Republican Party who voted for the bill did not suffer the same attacks. Uh, and even Mitch McConnell voted yes on this bill. So I think you're seeing some of those um, divisions and I think you're going to see a lot more conversation about this over the course of the next year or two. Looking now to the midterm elections, if Republicans are to win back the House or the Senate or both, would that potentially embolden those who have gone along with the idea of the conspiracy theories of the, the lies surrounding the election? If there is to be uh, a return to power, how would there end up being any kind of reckoning within the Republican Party? Depends on how those campaigns are run. 
If those campaigns are run the way Glenn Youngkin ran his campaign in Virginia and the way Jack Cittarelli ran his campaign in New Jersey, where we won the Virginia governorship and we won a number of seats in the two houses of the New Jersey State House, even though we came a bit short on the governorship, what you saw in both those races where they all talked about tomorrow and edu education, um, lower taxes, less spending, uh, they were not federal issues, and there was certainly nothing about the 2020 election. And in fact, both Glenn Youngkin and Jack Cirelli affirmatively asked the president, former president, not to come and campaign. So it depends on how the races are run um, in the competitive districts, Lindsay. If they're run in a forward-looking way, then I think there's a, there is a mandate. If they're not, then there may not be. I know that you've said that you'll make your decision about if you're going to run for president after the midterms are over. How do you respond to critics who say, look, when you left office in New Jersey, you had low ratings, that you've already had a, a failed bid for, for president, and now you've separated yourself from arguably the most popular person in your own party? How is that a recipe for success for running again? Well, all I know is that when, uh, when I ran for re-election in 2013, I got 60% of the vote and 51% of the Hispanic vote over 20% of the African-American vote. I'm not a lot of Republicans can boast that type of record in terms of how they've interacted with the voters. And so if I decide to run in 2024, it'll be based upon the things that we're talking about then, what's important, um, and either you make the sale with the voters or you don't. But you have to have confidence in yourself and you have to have confidence in the ideas you put forward. If I'm in that position, then I'll do it. And if I'm not, I won't. You've known the former president <clears throat> for many years. Do you think if he does decide to run again, that he'd be able to let go of the grievances of the past and, and focus on the important things, crime, border, the economy? If he were to be able to do that, could you potentially support him again? Now look, I hope that he does that a lot sooner than any decision he makes on the election. You know, right now we have Joe Biden and Kamala Harris trying to take the country in a particular direction. They won the election. They get to make those choices. We need to be a strong voice against it. And, and I would hope Donald Trump would be that strong voice. But uh, on the future and who's going to support who, we don't even know who's running yet. So let's wait on who's going to support who till the future. But what I will say is this, that when you're not telling the truth about the last election results, that is a, that is a big strike against you. Give our viewers a, a taste of the book because in the subtitle, you talk about the dangerous policies of, of Joe Biden. What's chief among them, would you say? Well, I think there's a few things. First, the, the, what I consider to be reckless spending that's going on in areas that, you know, quite frankly, the American people are not sure they really want to have spending in those areas. Second, increased taxes. Third, the foreign policy personified by the withdrawal in Afghanistan and the incompetent way that was handled. Um, our problems in Europe, um, where we had real problems with France regarding the deal we made with Australia on submarines. There's been a number of missteps in this administration so far, but the biggest one is trying to make the government a bigger part of our lives every day. I don't think that's what most Americans want, and I think to have a bigger, more powerful, more intrusive government is dangerous. Chris Christie, former governor of my home state of New Jersey, the Garden State, thank you so much. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Lindsay, great to be back with you. Thanks for having me. Congratulations on the book. Once again, his new book, Republican Rescue, Saving the Party from Truth Deniers, Conspiracy Theorists, and the Dangerous Policies of Joe Biden, goes on sale tomorrow. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.